and we are back and we are today this is broadband day uh commissioner tierney is with us and clay purvis and commissioner i've got you an update broadband update and radio towers proposal so i'm going to turn the floor over to you um and we've got you and clay and the floor is yours well thank you madam chair um, i'm pleased to say we're not going to kill your buzz uh, i think uh, you heard a, a wonderful presentation a moment ago and i think we have more good news to share with you i have to say um the biggest challenge of the summer was putting together that team um, that the governor was responsible for, and I don't think he could have had more complimentary um, appointments on the, the board. So uh, that was just, a, from my point of view, a small miracle. And I'm so pleased because the it's, it's fun to watch that board in action, the yeah. degree of uh, experience and competency. And to your point about um, the labor issues, I think that's really um, Christine's experience as a utility executive telling on her because our utilities have been dealing with the projected labor shortage for quite some time now. Succession, succession's been a concern of ours in the regulatory space. And so the CEOs of our utilities have really had to try to wrap their arms around that. So um, that's only the tip of the iceberg of the synergies. Um, I have to, to well, I was, I'm very pleased with the outcome of the last session and all the good work that this committee did. And here's your proof. Uh, Vermont's ahead of the curve and we're doing well. What I'm well, going to do now- sure, I'm gonna interrupt for a minute. Before yes. you tuned on, um, Christine Hallquist couldn't say enough good about the interaction with the department and oh, how well you. that has worked. So, um, that was another thing we couldn't quite figure out how this was all going to mesh, but it sounds like it's meshing. So it, it, thank it you and your people. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I don't know where we, that lawyer ended up, but. Well, no, no, it's very, very interesting from my perspective because Christine and I worked together to hire that lawyer for the VCBB. I did put off hiring a little bit because I really wanted the VCBB to have a say in hiring its own lawyer. So it was a bit of a gamble, but it really paid off and stands just a, a magnificent addition. So I'm, I'm very pleased that, um, that we've been able to live up to the, the trust that you invested in the department and placing the board there. Um, I remember at one point sort of saying to you, you know, just give it to me and I'll deal with it. And we did. <laughs> and it has really worked very nicely. But I, I have to say, um, all, all credit goes to Christine and her board and that staff. And on, on my end, my staff could not have worked harder to make that a seamless transition. So this is Vermont at its best. Yeah. And, um, and I think we, you know, when I look, I follow the developments about connectivity in the nation on a daily basis. I receive two readouts every day from State Newswire and another service. And when I look at what's going on in other states, uh, Christine's correct, we are far ahead of the curve. And given the, the pressing need to be ahead, principally materials and the like, uh, I think we can, it's not that we should pat ourselves on the back, but Vermonters can be very pleased that their government's functioning this way. And so much of that is owing to your leadership. So with that, um, I'm here with Clay, who's going to share with you an update on some of the uh, other matters that emerged from uh, CRF spending and the like uh, over the course of the summer, wrapping up some of those programs, and also tell you a little bit about where we've shifted our focus with uh, VCVB working on that last mile build out. It has really put the department in a position to look at the rest of the connectivity world and to say, okay, what else needs to be done that we can do? And that's where our self-service proposal comes from. So without further ado, I give you Director Purvis. Thank you, June. Uh, thank you, committee. And thank you, Madam Chair. Nice to be here again this year. Uh, as June alluded to, um, we covering a couple topics today. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm excited to share with you our proposal for wireless service, um, something we've been working hard on over this past summer and fall. 
uh, also talk a little bit about um, our broadband availability statistics, show you kind of where we are, where we've uh, come in the last two years, and then follow up um, with uh, some data on the uh, CARES Act programs that you all funded in 2020. Uh, so with that, I will have the awkward moment of trying to share my screen. Um, I feel like they moved buttons around since the last time I was in, in Zoom. So if someone knows where I can go to share my screen, that would be appreciate. I would appreciate that. Hey, Bottom you... of your screen, Clay. Oh, share screen, got it. Big green okay. button. All right, thank you. All right, uh, I'll start with the best stuff first. Um, we talk a little bit about our wireless proposal. Um, so you all passed Act 71 and that's been uh, moving along. Um, the, they're taking on broadband uh, and specifically wireline broadband in a big way at the Vermont Community Broadband Board. Um, as you'll recall, we completed the 10-year telecom plan uh, this past June. And that certainly addresses other aspects um, of telecommunications in Vermont other than just wireline broadband. And the big one that we hear about from Vermonters all the time is cell service. Uh, cell service is becoming more and more important. And um, we hear about it from all corners of the state, including in some of our uh, you know, suburban and urban areas. So this is a problem that affects everyone. We also hear about it uh, from tourists and uh, most notably public safety. So this summer, uh, once the telecom plan was done, we sat down and uh, thought about what we could do to address cell service uh, in the state. And uh, I think we've come up with a good plan um, that will certainly be helped with the, um, the federal dollars that the state has received. Um, <clears throat> this is not, uh, a, a, in a lot of ways, it's not new or innovative what we're trying to do. Um, we've really tried to come up with a plan that uh, fits neatly into the way the industry is already developed in the state and see if we can uh, accelerate that development uh, and put some towers in places where people really want them and need them. And certainly in places where there are um, important public safety considerations. So we've called our plan the Critical Communications Infrastructure Program. At a high level, what we want to do is spend $50 million and deploy uh, 100 cell towers, uh, macro cell towers around the state. Um, we want to do cell service that, uh, that helps people use the, the phone they already have in their pocket. And so for a lot of people, that's Verizon. That's AT&T service. So national carrier input is a big component of this. So we know uh, it kind of goes without saying, but we'll say it anyway. Uh, mobile wireless service is critical for telehealth, public safety, education, and the economy. Our focus here isn't broadband, so we're not we're, we're not looking at this from the the perspective of uh, someone. Uh, needing broadband at home. This is really about the mobile features of mobile wireless, about voice calls and about mobile data. We know that 71% of calls uh, to 911 originate from a mobile wireless phone. The vast majority of people who call 911 are doing so on their mobile phone. Um, and that's probably regardless of whether they're at home or at um, out, out and about. We know that 67% of Vermont telephone numbers are currently registered to mobile handsets. So the vast majority of, of phone numbers in the state are mobile wireless and that's growing. And then we know about half of Vermont adults live in a wireless only household. I think the statistic that sticks out the most to me though, and this, these statistics come from um, <clears throat> the NIH, is that 12% of Vermonters live in a landline only household. That happens to be the highest in the nation. Every other state, the percentage of adults living in a landline only household is lower. So Vermont stands out in its, um, in its high number of uh, folks who have not adopted wireless in any way. <clears throat> uh, as you recall, um, 
in 2018-19, we set about doing a, a drive test of the state of Vermont. Um, this is the first time that uh, anyone had act done actual drive testing of wireless service in the state. Um, <clears throat> and, and you remember the results of those. Um, about 70% of the road miles already have service from either Verizon or AT&T. 65% have uh, service from both. So there's a lot of overlap. Um, we know that 10% of uh, the Vermont road rays lack any kind of coverage and 62% have poor coverage. So even if there is coverage, that's where you're experiencing dropped calls. You can't hear the person. And these are the areas that we really wanna fix. I'll <clears throat> breeze through these, but here are the drive testing results. And you'll notice that the map has grown over time. We've worked with uh, volunteers and um, uh, other parties at the regional planning commissions and, and towns uh, to do a lot of additional drive testing. So we've covered a lot of Lamoille County, Central Vermont, um, and, and Cal some of Caledonia County as well. And um, we're very grateful for that work. But in Southern Vermont, as you can see, there's a lot of driving in Southern Vermont. And uh, it's just really underscored that even when you get off state highways, that the service is even worse. Um, there, there are many more gaps when, once you get off the highway. And then here's Verizon coverage, not much better. Um, we know today there are about 400 facilities. These are unique facilities that are broken down here. Uh, so when you think about 100 towers, the goal we're, we're striving for, uh, it's, it's really not that much. I mean, that's, that would end up being 20% of the, the total build uh, investment in, in Vermont. So um, you know what kind of coverage we have today with 400 towers. So you can imagine what an additional 100 will do. So we know new towers can cost upwards of 500,000. And in this day and age when inflation is seven or 8%, it's, it's probably gonna be more than that. Um, uh, towers are, are expensive um, uh, facilities to deploy. Um, much of the development we've seen in the state, almost all of it has been private. So, this would be the first significant uh, public investment of, of coverage. And what we're seeing now, uh, while there are new towers going up, you know, they're not going up at the rate Vermonters, I think would appreciate. And as carriers move to 5G, there's gonna be a lot of upgrading of existing facilities. And so our worry is that Places with no coverage today uh, will not see that new coverage um, without some kind of support. So we've come up with a proposal, uh, it's a five-step proposal. I've provided the committee with a, a longer white paper that outlines uh, the proposal, but it starts with a drive test and we've actually begun the drive test. We have an RFP out right now uh, to hire um, to, to purchase software and hire consulting services to assist us with that drive test. This will be a little different than the last drive test we did. We won't have phones in a cardboard box. Um, I think it's gonna be a little more sophisticated. And we'll have newer, better um, software uh, that I think will we'll take better tests and we'll be doing more testing. So we won't just do one pass. We'll do multiple passes of the same road. Um, we're working with uh, the uh, VTrans uh, to do that testing, so um, we'll have the help of VTrans employees who um, are already driving Vermont roads. And, and then we've also reached out to RPCs, um, and, and we may have um, more help from them as well. Uh, so once we have the drive testing results, we'll identify target corridors. These are the areas where we want to see service. We're gonna be working with towns, public safety is a, a, a big uh, important stakeholder in that discussion. RPCs and other interested parties to, to figure out where we should put these towers. We don't anticipate that 100 towers will provide universal ubiquitous service across the entire state. So we wanna make sure we prioritize the areas that really do need service and, and start with those. So we'll undergo, um, kind of stakeholder engagement process to determine those areas. 
once we have the target corridors identified, um, we'll be hiring a, a consulting firm to assist with uh, search rings development, search ring development. This, these are areas where a tower could be placed to reach uh, the target corridors. And then once we have that, uh, we'll uh, set up a process for um, bidding these these uh, search rings target corridors to um, the carriers. It begins with an RFP to determine, uh, or a solicitation, I should say, to uh, national carriers and regional carriers to determine what rental uh, amount they would pay in each search ring. So how much would you pay a month to be on a tower here? We expect that amount to be uh, well below market for a lot of these areas um, and uh, to make sure that we get interest in these areas, we provide a subsidy to the carriers uh, to deploy their equipment on these towers. Once we have the rental income determined for all 100 search rings, and we have at least two carriers on each one that um, we would put uh, out to bid for construction of the towers in the search rings. And th these towers would be uh, built and owned by a, a tower construction company. Generally, uh, any cell towers owned by a company other than at and and Verizon, they're owned by um, a separate entity that manages uh, the, the physical infrastructure on which the uh, cell equipment is attached. So uh, we would uh, then find a firm to, to build those facilities um, and operate them. Um, as part of this process, we wanna make sure we open some space on towers to public safety entities for uh, land mobile radio equipment. So that's an important aspect of this. So um, what we've heard from public safety in the past that uh, there's a hesitation to move to say FirstNet or other um, uh, public safety um, broadband networks because of the the coverage gaps and and the um, uncertainty about the, the consistency of coverage. So uh, to have LMR available um, and free rental on these towers um, would go a long way towards expanding um, radio service for public uh, safety. Okay, uh, yeah, Clay, my local public safety group is looking for $5 million for uh, to just update their radio equipment for exactly that reason. They, there's just too many places where, you know, if, if you've got AT&T and only Verizon covers it or there's no coverage and they can't afford that in a, you know, a time of crisis. So um, it'll be helpful to see how much of a dent we put in that. Yes, thank you. That's a good point. Um, you know, we, we've heard the same and we're trying to respond to it. I think our plan here really gets to their, their kind of operating budget rather than their capital needs. Yeah. Um, updating the system is one thing, but this would provide the kind of the free rental space on the tower. So if they wanted to expand their okay. network or um, upgrade or change their network, this would provide new and free opportunities uh, to do that. Um, but we, we've heard the same and um, not just the, the tower equipment is important to them, but the, the base stations and the, uh, the actual radio handsets are another uh, very expensive component to, yeah. um, uh, to, to their network. Okay, and someday we'll have to find out who to talk to about FirstNet and their progress. I'm going to ask, because I'm sure our citizen advocate is watching this, um, when we build these towers, who sets the specifications that, you know, wind, you know, the ability to withstand wind, hurricane, ice, uh, how are those specs set up? It, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are engineering standards um, that uh, uh, the industry follows uh, set by uh, an independent um, 
independent group that advises the industry. And uh, we, we call the standard the 222G standard that sets these specifications. There's a heightened standard and that's certainly something we could consider. Um, other aspects of resiliency that um, may be of interest are the power backup, you know, what, um, uh, what kind of generators at the facility, and certainly that's something that um, could be addressed through this process. Okay. Uh, backhaul, whether there's redundancy in backhaul, and certainly backhaul will be an issue, but uh, I don't think a, a, a big issue for a lot of these facilities. Um, so that's certainly something, you know, we take a look at, but that would be, um, I think, you know, best handled by the the firm that's uh, established to, um, uh, to to identify the search rings and um, kind of set up the um, the RFP, the auction aspect of, of the, the process. Okay. Okay. I think we can they ask your question, on. Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Brock. I, I just wanted to uh, perhaps understand better uh, the, the bidding process and the carriers that would be on uh, a, uh, a particular tower, uh, would there be in, in the bidding process, would there be one winner for uh, an individual tower or, or could there be multiple people who would uh, bid uh, for their uh, connectivity to be on that tower? Uh, that, that's a good question. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I think I glossed over that that aspect. What we want to build here are multi-carrier towers. Okay. Ideally, towers that have at least three uh, spaces for three different carriers. Um, we want to get at least two carriers on each tower. So we would ask the tower construction company uh, or require them to accept the, the two highest bids um, for, for space on that tower. Um, the, the company paying the most, of course, we get the top spot and um, the company paying the second most, we get the, the, the secondary spot. Um, but we want to see two carriers. I think there's some caveats to that, however. Um, and then there's another challenge that I want to uh, address in a minute. Um, one caveat is that some areas we think are going to be um, either too expensive uh, to deploy a facility um, using this method, um, or they're just they're, there's not going to be enough interest in that facility um, because, as you know, these facilities are developed to drive subscribership. You know, they're 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 building a, a tower to get new subscribers. That's how they generate their revenue. So, in those cases, we may be looking at uh, a neutral host model for some. Um, that that's not our principal. Um, strategy. It's not our exclusive strategy, but we want to make sure that we keep this process open uh, to um, neutral host uh, carriers, um, specifically for those areas that are going to be so remote that um, even with all the incentive in the world, at and Verizon or another carrier Sprint uh, wouldn't be induced to, to deploy in those spaces. Um, one challenge that we'll have to work through is, is cherry picking. Um, if you if you have a hundred different spaces that um, you know the, the carriers would be encouraged to only go on the ones that make financial sense for them and avoid going on towers that are less lucrative or not lucrative at all. Um, and we want to uh, protect against that. So we're thinking of different ways of structuring it. One could be um, marrying, um, you know, the good sites with the poor sites. Um, winner takes all is, is one, but I think that's a high risk. Um, but I think there are ways to overcome that challenge. And we're certainly thinking about that. Well, I guess one of the questions that would come to mind immediately is, uh, you know, for particular towers or group of towers, if you wound up with Joe's cell service and Harry's bargain cell service uh, on the tower, the people who have AT&T and Verizon going from point A to point B would still probably not have any coverage unless there were, in effect, interline agreements. Is that a risk? 
Uh, we are going to avoid that risk by requiring that national uh, carrier coverage uh, be provided. So um, we're not interested in Joe's bargain cell service. Um, this has to be um, Verizon and AT&T. And, and we've spoken with all the national carriers and um, I believe all of the regional carriers about this proposal as well. Um, so, you know, we've, we've worked through um, those concerns, I believe, um, but we're not interested uh, in developing a site with um, cell service that you, you don't buy and you've never heard of before. Uh, we want two out of the three carriers to be national, national carriers. Well, I remember the issue that we had with Coverage Co., for example, in that we had these uh, cell service uh, set up uh, throughout a lot of rural Vermont, but one particular carrier, in this case AT&T, declined to participate in an interline, in any type of interline way, uh, capacity, and as a result, uh, it limited the ability of the driver, who we were concerned about for E911 uh, connectivity, to be able to use those towers. Is that going to be a problem here as well? Or otherwise, is there a way in which we could ensure as a minimum that E911 service is available from any carrier who uses one of these towers? No, that's certainly, um, that is certainly a concern that we've thought about and are trying to overcome. Um, when, when dialing 911, you, even if you are a Verizon customer, in many cases, in most cases, you should be able to reach 911 through an AT&T facility and vice versa. Um, you know, and, and we're, that, that is certainly uh, going to be an important aspect of this. Um, th this is primarily uh, to ensure public safety along state highways. That's why we want to do this. Um, we want to make sure that- Wasn't was that the problem though that you had with Coverage Pro is that the AT&T customer <clears throat> or, or a, at least some set of customers couldn't get 911 with the Coverage Co uh, radios. I don't remember the specifics of why that was the case, but my understanding was that in a lot of instances they could. Um, the Coverage Co radios were at the time that they were being deployed already antiquated technology and they ran over the top on DSL, uh, which was problematic, even if you were a Verizon customer. So um, I take your point. It's certainly something we wanna avoid uh, but unlike Coverage Co., these are going to be real cell towers with um, national carriers on them. Um, this is not going to be like the, the Coverage Co. network uh, in any way. Let me just ask one final question. Is, is there, uh, has there been contemplated any requirement on these uh, towers uh, that they be available, much like in a neutral host uh, situation by whoever the the winning bidder is, but, but to allow some control so that they can profit from adding additional service uh, upon request? Uh, we haven't, uh, well, I think there's a couple ways to answer that question. Um, when I think of neutral host in the macro cell uh, context, I really think of the poll being the neutral host, the, the tower uh, construction company and owner is the neutral host. And certainly they would be able to monetize um, the facility and add additional carriers as is feasible. They can enlarge and expand uh, at a later point. Uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, requiring say at and and Verizon uh, to open up their facilities, they certainly have roaming agreements with other carriers. Um, for instance, VTEL will carry Sprint and AT&T service on their network. So those opportunities are there. Um, at, at the same time, we want to make sure that we get uh, as wide participation in, excuse me, in the program as possible. So uh, to the extent that expands participation, I think we're open to it. If it contracts and um, uh, scares carriers away from participation. I don't think that's something we want to look at. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Madam Chair? Yes. Um, I, I have a couple questions. Uh, thank you, Clay. 
<clears throat> I'm trying to understand the ownership structure you're laying out. So we're paying, we're, we're the state taxpayers are funding construction of the polls um, and then <clears throat> uh, doing the organizing to get carriers ready to lease space. Is that how that works? Um, to the poll owner and then and then seeking bids for people to do the construction, right? Is that the, the relationships you've laid out? Yes. And, and then in exchange for that, uh, we get the poll in place and we get, we get some bandwidth for, for 911. Um, but why, why would we give the poll away? Why, why not, why not put out, use our money to pay somebody to erect the poll? And, you know, these are not, you've described market, uh, um, you know, competitive in the, in that sense, but there will be some revenue generated. Otherwise nobody would ever want to own them. So I, I I'm not, why wouldn't the state maintain ownership and, stick that money in a revolving fund for our future telecom needs? Well, that's a good question, Senator Pearson. Uh, I think the answer, um, and, and certainly reasonable minds can disagree on this point, but uh, I, I think it's important to uh, consider where these towers are going to go. Um, if, if there was business case to put uh, these facilities in these areas, I think there would already be cell service there. If you could make money um, developing these areas, um, they would be developed. Um, I think the business case at best is going to be marginal and this certainly helps uh, to have a subsidy of this magnitude, but you know, $500,000 a tower, we don't anticipate that this is going to be 100% of the cost of those towers. Um, we're, we're we're estimating that that is the subsidy that would be needed to develop this many towers, but there's going to be private investment, I think, that goes into them. Um, I think ownership comes uh, at, a, at a price, and um, if you own the tower, then you have to maintain it. And so the question is, what, what kind of staff um, and, and uh, technical resources do you need to develop, either in state government or out of state government, uh, what does that cost and what does management of 100 towers looks like? Um, the state currently has about 19 telecommunications facilities that it owns or owns the underlying land for. Um, and so we have um, a management um, aspect to those facilities, but I don't know that um, owning 100 towers um, would be something that um, would, would prove to be uh, a revenue generator when you factor in the costs. A lot of these tower construction companies, they own towers all over the country, um, or at least they own them regionally. They would be folding uh, these facilities into their existing portfolio um, You know that runs all across New England, that run, runs across the Northeast. So, um, you know, what we really want is the coverage and this gets us the coverage and then it gets us space to deploy our own, um, our own equipment for uh, state government and uh, municipal government needs um, without the, the headache of owning um, and managing a uh, hundred um, new, new state government facilities. Okay, Clay, as part of what's going on, are you using ARPA funds or one-time funds to build these? But then if we own them and are responsible for them, we have to do the ongoing, not one-time funds of staffing and equipping and we're going to have to be the ones to go out there and report when there's an outage to E911 within I forget how many hours we put up there. And I gather these are probably more remote areas, so it will take us longer. Uh, is that what one of the driving forces here is the one time investment versus the ongoing expense? Yes, um, I, I think that that's uh, an important aspect of this. 
Um, you know, we, we've owned telecom facilities in the past, so we know, um, we know what that's like. Um, what we're trying to do is really get the maximum benefit w without the, the ongoing cost, as you pointed okay. out. Um, I think it's still incumbent on at and and Verizon to report outages as the, the poll yeah. owner doesn't do that. But, you know, making sure there's, there's diesel in the generator, um, if there's a backhaul, if there's a fiber cut to the backhaul, um, you know, getting that repaired, mm -hmm. um, things saw. like that, 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 you know, would, would take okay. resources and um, financing to. So what to we're really talking about doing is using the one-time money we have to subsidize, and we can live out the details to how we subsidize, but subsidize the building of towers in areas where there just aren't enough customers to make it uh, cost effective for carriers to do it on their own. That's that's the problem we're working on, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Did I hear a voice? I'm flying blind here. Okay. So let's keep moving all right uh well i think that wraps up um our uh discussion of of the the tower proposal just one last thing about the the drive test um we will be testing uh, all the facilities based carriers um as well as first net and um we're going to be starting that this winter and working on that into the summer um with our own budget so um, won't uh, depend on the appropriation, but um, you know we're hoping to have kind of the first um, statewide uh, yep. picture of what cover FirstNet uh, looks like um, now that it's substantially deployed. Okay, can you do Route Two going into Marshfield? I have a constituent who says there's no cell service and everybody parks in his business to answer their phone. Yes. I wasn't driving, I was riding and I have Verizon. I showed a bar going out there, not a big one, but actually as much as I get in Montpelier. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking maybe it is some, maybe AT&T doesn't cover out there. Um, that, that is that is certainly a target corridor high on my mind. Um, yes. The drive between uh, Montpelier and, and St. Jay is, it's a difficult one uh, with a lot of, of gaps and it certainly needs to be solved. Hopefully without bringing the service to Groton State Forest. I do enjoy not having cell service there, but um, I think we all have our places where we wanna see the coverage and I also think there are places where we don't want coverage. Um, and um, I think we need to be careful uh, when we select our target corridors and create our search rings that we're not, um, um, that, that we're being thoughtful about where people do and do not want uh, cell service. So um, yeah. I'm hopeful that this process will, will um, help bring that conversation around. Okay. Right. I think, Clay, yeah, if you take your slide down, we are okay. close to the end of time for this, but we will definitely have Clay back. So, Clay, what you're proposing to do is you're going to contract with a cell tower owner to build, you're going to pay them and you're going to pay them and they will build according to engineering standards. Um, and I assume we will set standards for backhaul and other things, but we will use state money to build the tower or subsidize building the tower, whatever deal you can get. And then the owner is responsible for leasing out space on that tower 
and the carriers will bid on how much they they feel they can pay to have space on that tower based on the fact that if they thought they could make money on it, they would have done it by now. These are rural roads. Um, yeah. Correct. Yes. Okay. We're, 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 um, what, what the carrier is going to get is uh, a below market because we've subsidized the tower. So the tower owner can afford to take a below market rental fee uh, from the carrier. And then the carrier is going to get a subsidy for its equipment um, up to say $150,000 for the equipment uh, and a below market um, rental fee, which uh, we're anticipating will be enough to induce them to wanna to be on the tower. Okay, so that gives us something to think about. Um, I'm sure we will have you back for more discussion. Um, Commissioner Tierney, do you have anything you wanna add at the end? I've got the next, the next discussions, uh, two discussions up folks are already lining up here, so. And I, I think a number of those folks are my crew talking to you about um, uh, energy supply. Madam Chair, yes. I, I just wanted to note that we did advertise to the committee that Clay had a short update on CRF funding and the like. And maybe the thing to do is to have him back to present the balance of his slides, or unless you want to take three oh. minutes to do that real quick. Can you do it in three minutes rather than haul you um, back? I, I can try. Um... Let me, uh, we won't ask questions. Don't ask questions. Yeah. And then uh, let's see if I can. Okay. I thought right. we um, got I apologize. Going, going, yeah, I apologize. I'm happy to come back if that would be, uh, that would now, be better. Now, if you can do this in, in five minutes. Sure. If we're only five minutes behind. We're ahead. Uh, good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we've published uh, updated broadband statistics. Um, and I just wanna share those with you quickly because I think they're important for the committee to see. Um, here are speed tiers. I think you're well acquainted with what speed tiers are now. 100, 100 is fiber, 100 slash 20, that's cable TV. That's your Comcast charter, uh, okay. stone cable and the like. And 25.3 um, is, is cable and some other carriers that uh, some areas have really good DSL. When I say good DSL is not good, but it's um, it's at least 25.3. And then um, some of the wireless uh, that we funded, uh, and then 401, you know what that is. But the the, the big takeaway here is um, fiber to the home went from 17 and a half percent of the state uh, to 29.2, so pretty much almost 30 percent. Um, so that's um, that's an incredible leap uh, on fiber to the premises yeah. in the last two years. Um, significant investment uh, from consolidated uh, Waitsfield, Champlain Valley, and, and some of the other uh, incumbent telephone companies have really pushed that number up. So um, progress is being made. Okay, that's good to know. This is something new we've added uh, that may be of interest um, to you as you uh, think about changes to Act 71. Um, we've done a road miles analysis. These are the number of miles of road that have each type of service, fiber, cable. And what would be of interest to you is the no cable. So um, over 7,000 road miles uh, with no cable service, that's where your CUDs are our, um, uh, our targeting. So um, this is where the 20% of the locations that don't have good broadband, that's where they live uh, in the takeaway. Okay, so they have schools. no cable and they don't have good broadband. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they live on a lot of roads. That's the takeaway. Yeah. Uh, few locations, a lot of roads. And uh, Christine okay. Halquist told you that was $55,000 a mile. So you can multiply. Um, I think she did that in her presentation. Yeah. Um, RDOF, um, as you know, that that is um, the the bidding process for uh, the RDOF program is uh, over, and we know where those are. 
CCI has about half of, of the target locations. It's about 8,000 locations in the state. Um, so, we, you know, all in all, uh, RDOF is going to take care of 14,000 uh, locations that um, lack 25.3 today. That's a significant investment. Okay, um, but they may um, only be bringing that up to 25.3. No, they are all going to do... Um, they're all going to do 100 100 here. Okay, that's good news then. This, all this right. is all this is all fiber. Uh, the the RDOF, the FCC has to authorize uh, the application. So they bid on all of these companies bid um, and then the uh, once they win the bid, the FCC has a process for um, approving their application and authorizing the the money, uh, the support. Uh, currently, CCI is the only one that's been authorized, so we're still waiting um, a final determination for the others. But CCI is definitely the largest, okay. Yes, and and they are they are good to go. They're receiving support um, already. So um, this is our 2020 uh, connectivity initiative. Um, uh, all in all. Um, uh, just under 10,000 locations. Um, you can see uh, different types of technology um, that, that we uh, um, uh, deployed. Um, LeCap, uh, all in all, about almost so 600 applications. We have a lot of applications that they couldn't get to uh, before the expiration of CARES Act. So um, not everyone who wanted um, Lee cap could get it. Um, this is a function of um, time, not money. Um, okay. Fortunately, but um, you can see the breakdown of Lee cap applications. And this was uh, okay. This was it comes to the end of my road or it comes to the bottom of the hill and it's going to cost me five thousand dollars to bring it up. It's that line extension, right? That's that's correct. Okay. Uh, we did we did drops. You know that was an issue. Uh, it, it goes by my road, but it doesn't come up my driveway, and I can't afford it uh, unless I have help. So we did a lot of driveways. We did a lot of uh, dirt roads and private road kind of installations, yeah. um, and we had good success, especially towards the end. Um, uh, we did a really great project, for instance, in, in Bolton uh, with Waitsfield Champlain Valley Telecom. Uh, Franklin Telephone did a lot of um, applications towards the end yeah. um, that uh, really uh, helped those customers. Um, so they told us they have a 10 mile stretch with one customer left. That's that's right. <laughs> We're um, not sure how they're going to get there, but they did. Uh, they did sound good. Okay. And then the last is our our TBS program. Um, this, it goes to Senator Sorotkin's question about um, uh, about broadband equity and affordability. Um, so we we had this uh, this broadband subsidy program. Um, the first year we had almost three thousand applications, and the second year we had just over two thousand. Um, by the year two, we were competing with the FCC's program. So. Um, we let the FCC take priority, and if you applied for both yep. programs, we let the FCC pay fifty dollars towards your bill, and we got the remainder. So uh, we ended up giving away less money uh, because there was this other program, but we still helped a lot of people, um, and a lot of people were grateful for it. So um, that was certainly um, a program that we're counting as, as a success, um, and. With the infrastructure bill, there's uh, a lot of money for broadband equity and affordability programs. These will again be state block grants. So the state will have to come up with an equity plan. Um, if I recall, there's 65 billion for that. Uh, there's a lot of money for the states for that. Um, so we'll have to we'll, get to work on that. The, yes, there's gonna be a lot to do and uh, the okay. NTI is writing rules for that. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there and it goes beyond affordability. It goes to devices, to, um, digital literacy and, um, other issues of equity. Oh, um, okay. that are top of mind. can you get us a copy of that section of the bill? 
Sure. Okay. Happy to do that. Send it to Faith and she can get it to us so we know. That's becoming the challenge, knowing what we have to work with and what the rules are. So that would be good. And we can, you know, I'm assuming you're starting working on plans and we can start working with you. Um, I'm going to have to wrap this up because I think we are mm -hmm. over our five minutes. Well, yes, thank you very we're much eight for minutes us. over. So we're going to have to go on.